Hello and welcome to lecture 3 of the energy unit in Phys 1104. In this lecture I'm first going to derive something that I claimed two lectures ago, which is that whenever the uh, relative speed is unchanged by a collision, the kinetic energy remains the same. And then we're going to use some tools from that derivation to solve some elastic collision problems. So I've set up some things here that I'm going to need in the derivation, and they're all things we've seen before. The first is this, that the relative speed before the collision is the same as the relative speed after. And the other thing I've set up here is the expression which is telling us that momentum is conserved. This is only if the system is isolated, but here is an expression for the one-dimensional case along the x-axis of conservation of momentum. And there are just a couple of more ingredients I need. and I've got them down here. One is our way of calculating a relative speed in one dimension. And I showed you this earlier. We just take the absolute value of the differences in the x components in the velocities. The final piece I need here is just to take the statement that the relative speed is the same before and after and rewrite it using that. So all I've done here is taken v12i and I've expanded it out using this expression and I've done the same for the other side of the equation. And now look at this equation. This is a bit of a mess. If you've ever worked any equations with absolute values, you know that absolute values are a total pain in the butt. You do not want to work equations with absolute values. So we need to drop these absolute values somehow, and that means we have to think about the signs of each side. The fact that the absolute values are here is telling us that the size of the thing on this side of the equation is the same as the size of the thing on this side, but that there's some sign difficulty that gets in the way of us just saying they're equal. So let's figure out what that sign difficulty is. So I've got a diagram here of a very particular sort of collision where it's easy to see how this works out where I have some object 2, which is initially catching up with some object 1, and they collide, and so afterwards object 1 is now moving away faster. And if you look at this, you can see that initially the x component of v2 is larger than the x component of v1. That's why v2 is catching up with v1. So in other words, all of this inside the absolute values over here is positive for this particular collision. Meanwhile, this one, after v1x is larger than v2x, and so the things inside the absolute values over here are negative. Well, that tells us how we can drop the absolute values. We just need to put a negative out front of this to get rid of that negative. And now we've dropped the absolute values. Now, you might be thinking, but wait a second, Jeff, that applies to this collision, but what about other collisions? Well, just interpret this. This is the x component of v12. In other words, it's the x component of the relative velocity of these two. And the other side is the negative of v12x. And so it's just that this one is initial and this one is final. What is that telling us? Well, what this is telling us is that if the objects are coming toward each other initially, they must be going away from each other finally. Well, that makes perfect sense. As long as the objects don't pass through each other, this has to be true, that the relative velocity x component switches sign during the collision. Now we have all the ingredients we need. We're going to mostly work with this and with our conservation of momentum equation. So the first thing I'm going to do in this derivation is I'm going to take this and I'm going to collect the ones on one side and the twos on the other. And I'm just going to, for convenience, switch which side of the equation these are on, which is really easy. 
when I'm doing it on a computer like this. Next, I'm going to collect the ones on one side and the twos on the other side in my momentum equation. And I'm going to factor out the m's as I do it. So now I'm going to call these equations 1 and 2. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply them together. In other words, I'm going to multiply the right side of equation 1 by the right side of equation 2 and the left side of 1 with the left side of 2. So that gives me this. And now if I just multiply those out, notice there's going, there are going to be cross terms that are going to cancel because of the way the negatives work. So there's a negative V1F, V1I, and a positive V1F, V1I, and so those will cancel, and so on. So what I end up getting is that all of the cross terms cancel, and I'm only left with V's squared. And now I'm almost done. I'm going to once again collect F's on one side and I's on the other. And there we have it. What you're seeing, if I now just multiply through by a half, and I'll talk about why I multiply through that by a half in a moment, is K1I plus K2I equals K1F plus K2F, that the, the sum of the kinetic energies do not change. And I derived that from conservation of momentum and the relative speeds being the same before and after. So the relative speeds being before, the same and after, implies that the kinetic energy doesn't change, just as I claimed two lectures ago. To close off, I'll just say that this factor of a half I multiplied through by is purely a matter of convenience. There would be nothing wrong with defining kinetic energy without that factor of a half. The problem is it would lead to a bunch of factors of two lying around on all of the other energies that we'll eventually be dealing with. And so it's more convenient to put this half in on the kinetic energy. Now that we know some new methods, let's see what awesome powers they give us. So here is a setup for a collision. Let's say these are low friction carts so that we don't have to worry. This is a nice isolated system and that they're going to collide elastically. So this is probably using magnetic ends on the carts, right? And I've given some numbers for the inertias of these two carts and I've indicated how fast they're going and in which direction. And one thing we already know from the last unit is that since this is an isolated system, the momentum will be conserved. So here's the conservation of the x components of momentum written out. But notice that here we know the masses and we know both initial velocities but we don't know either of the final velocities. Now if you look back at the sorts of things we were able to do in the previous unit just with conservation of momentum, we always either knew one of the final velocities or we knew that the carts stuck together so that they were moving with the same velocity or some other piece of information like that. And so we always only had one unknown. But now we've got two unknowns. And this is a common sort of situation when you're thinking through, in real life, a collision. You may know what's going on before the collision, you'd love to know after, and you don't have any information about after. So we simply can't solve this because we have two unknowns. Well, conservation of energy to the rescue. So we have two options. We know, if this is an elastic collision, that 
the kinetic energy is conserved. And so there is the equation written out for the conservation of kinetic energy in this closed system. But, you know, look at that. If we're going to solve this system of equations in two unknowns, where the unknowns are squared over here, you probably know how to solve systems of linear equations. You might not be really happy about solving linear systems of linear equations, but I'm sure you know how. But as soon as you've got things squared lying around, you might be a little uncomfortable. So maybe we don't want to do that. So what do we do? Well, we also know that we can use the fact that the carts have the same relative speeds before and after. Now, here is the form that we ended up being able to write that in uh, during the derivation, right? Where we're saying basically that the x component of the relative velocities changes sign during the collision. That is what this equation is saying. That's now looking a lot friendlier. Now we have a system of two linear equations to solve in two unknowns. And we can do that. So I'm going to do the first step, and then I'm going to leave you to do the algebra, and you can check against what I get at the end. So the first step, look at these. We want to isolate one of our unknown variables, and then substitute the expression for it into the other one, so that we can get that variable out and have an equation in only one unknown. And this equation here, the second one, is the easier one to solve for one of the v's out of, and so let's make things easy and solve for one of them out of here. So I'm going to solve just arbitrarily, it looks to me like vbfx is going to be easiest to solve for, so I'm just going to solve for it, and basically all I'm doing is I've said negative, negative, I get a positive VBFX, I'm going to take it over to this side, I'm flipping the sides, just, and then I have a negative VAFX that comes over onto the other side with everything else that was already over there. So I can now take this and substitute it in to the, the conservation of momentum equation. That'll get rid of VBFX in that equation, and I'll have an equation in one unknown that I can solve for that unknown. So I would like you to pause the video now, and you do the algebra, and when you start up, you will just see my solution of it, and you can check yours against mine. Here is my algebra for you to check against your own, and you may not have written this final answer in the same form, but if we substitute in values, it becomes easy to check your number against mine. So I've summarized the values here that we're substituting in, and just note that VBIx, the x component of VBI, is negative because it was pointing back in the negative x direction, and that's about the only thing that's likely to go wrong now. If you substitute those into here, you get this, negative 0.28 meters per second. If we want the other velocity as well, then we can get it easily, because from the relative speed equation here, we've already solved for it, and we now know all these velocities, so we can just substitute them in, and if you do, you find this. I'll just make a quick note about units. In here, we have kilograms in a numerator, kilograms in a denominator, they cancel, and we're left with meters per second. And so we know everything's worked out right. And finally, it's good to do a check. And with collisions, it's easy. Look, we know that the relative speeds have to have remained the same. The relative speed, look at that, was 0.4 meters per second initially, and indeed, if you look here, the relative speed is 0.4 meters per second after. And so that indicates that we have probably not made an error. If we wanted to be really sure, we could also substitute in, in and make sure that the conservation of momentum works out.